Hey everyone, in this part of the lecture, we're going to talk about metrics of and losses for model evaluation. So we're going to talk about the definition of a metric and a, a loss. Uh, we're going to talk about metrics and losses for regression and classification. I'm going to review also a um, multi-class and multi-level classification. And I'm also going to talk about losses and metrics for classification. Yeah, so what is the difference between a metric and a loss? So the way to think about it is that um, the loss is what we optimize. So when we're trying to fit a model, we are optimizing a loss. We are using gradient descent to minimize that function that is a loss or a cost function. Uh, now, sometimes uh, these uh, loss or cost functions are very hard to interpret. So you come to your boss and say, hey, I have my log loss is uh, a 0.5. And he's like, but is it that good? Is it bad? Or you say my, my loss is like 4.3. And he just has no idea because maybe he's not as technical as you. He doesn't understand the problem as well. Now, if you go to your boss and says, you know, I have like 95% accuracy, he has a very clear idea what you're talking about, right? So the difference uh, between a metric and a loss is just that the metric is humanly interpretable measure of your model, uh, something that more people are going to be able to understand. And in hopefully in many cases also it has a business objective. So an example is, you know, log loss is a loss. It's just hard to understand. And accuracy is a metric. So, it, so you may think about, hey, why don't we just try to uh, optimize accuracy right away, right? And it, it's just that it's, it's hard to directly optimize accuracy. So to get an accuracy, we usually need a hard prediction. And usually when we optimize, we are trying to get soft predictions. We're trying to get probabilities, mm -hmm. okay? So we're going to talk about the following a uh, losses and metrics for regression and classification. We're going to talk about MSE, RMSE, R squared, MI. And for classification, we're going to talk about accuracy, log loss, AUC, and F score. So, so this is kind of the notation that I use. So I, 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 I put the, the, the basically the observation I on, on kind of on top. So we're going to talk about X i on top and y i kind of on top uh, upper script i guess and and then we're going to talk about um predictions as y hat and then we're also going to sometimes talk about y hat so i would be the observation i for observation i so the main loss function that people optimize for regression is the mean square error and as you guys know, this is the formula for the mean square error. One question I have for you here, uh, something that will be kind of useful later on, is that what would be the best constant function that would minimize this error? And I want you guys to think about that. So, so another way of uh, asking the same question is that what would be the, the alpha, the constant alpha? in this case that will minimize that function that I have here. So such that y i minus alpha square, the, the mean of that is going to be um, <clears throat> minimized. So it's not that difficult to go through the calculation to understand that the mean would be that constant function. So how we do that? So you can take MSE and derivate with respect to alpha, uh, set that to zero, and that will give you that um, the best constant will be the sample mean. Okay, and I hope you guys kind of do this exercise to, to do that. So another, um, another metric people talk about is the square of MSE. And now this is just you take MSE and take the square function, the square the square of that, the square root of that, 
Um, and um, the difference between MSC and RMSC is that uh, RMSC is in the unit, the unit of the variant variable of interest. So it might be a little bit more interpretable than MSC. <clears throat> I often uh, find that the best way, like one of one of the best or one of the metrics that you should use for regression is R square. So we know that R square, uh, we know that MSC and RMSC in a way are kind of hard to interpret unless you have been kind of working with the problem for some time. Our uh, R square is not perfect, but at least it uh, is a number between zero and one, and it's measuring uh, how much our model is better than a constant baseline, and basically just kind of the mean baseline. Optimizing R square and optimizing MSC is equivalent, so in a way it's just a different way to write the the MSC um, uh, loss. And uh, yeah, so I would suggest that you guys use R square uh, every time that you're using MS MSC as a loss, okay? Because it it's gonna give you a number between zero and one, um, you know, and at least you get an idea that you, you know, sometimes you compute R square and your number is negative, right? So you if, if your number is negative, you at least know that uh, basically, you, you don't have a very good model. Your model is worse than the the mean of the target variable. So that that at least will give you give you that idea. So so I suggest that you compute R square every time you have a regression problem, and you are um, optimizing MSE. So a lot of people also use a mean absolute error. So uh, my so my and MSC are the most used metric for for regression. There are some other metrics as well, but these are the most uh, used metrics. And um, yeah, so you can use my. So what's the difference between my and MSC is that my is a little bit less prone to outliers. So if you have a problem with outliers, you should use my instead of MSC. So what's the optimal constant function uh, in the case of my? And this proof is a little bit more sophisticated, more complicated, uh, more evolved, but you can prove that the median of the target variables is the best alpha that you can compute here. Um, yeah, so this 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 is gonna be a little bit more complicated to prove, but if you are interested in that, I can I can find you a proof. So so basically, I think I already told you that that um, both my and MSE are um, used for regression. Uh, I oftentimes uh, like to use my instead of MSE because of um, basically the fact that uh, MSC tends to be more prone to outliers, more, uh, um, so I tend, I try to use my uh, many of the times that I have regression problems. So let's do a little bit review of classification before we get into metrics for classification and losses for classification. So, so you guys know about binary classification. So in this case, we have some images of cats and dogs, and we just have two labels. That's binary classification because we just have two labels. And one label, uh, every image, every observation is either a cat or a dog, right? So that's kind of binary classification. So multi-class classification is when we have more than two labels. So in this case, we have three labels. We have cats, dogs, and birds. And each image is a, it has just either a cat, a dog, or a bird, right? So this is multi-class classification. There's another related problem that is called multi-label classification. In this problem, we, for example, may have images, and if image may have several classes. 
For example, uh, here we have two images and the second image has three classes, agriculture, clear, primary and water, actually four classes. So, so this is uh, this actually these images were from a cal competition, and so and you had to, uh, for each piece of, of these images are pieces from bigger images, and from each piece you had to predict everything that was in that image. So. Uh, so let me talk about a bit of other terms that are going to be useful here. So soft predictions. Um, so soft predictions are often when we talk about classification, where we have our probabilities. And these are soft predictions. Now, from soft predictions, you can get actual labels. Like if you have a 0, 1, for example, a binary classification, uh, you can get uh, you can get basically from probabilities get into labels. There are different ways into going from probabilities to labels. Um, if you are in binary classification, you have a number like a probability, and you can have a threshold. That threshold often is zero point five, but you can also look at what is the best threshold for your problem, and we can talk about that a bit later. But basically, you can find a threshold and say, well, everything that's bigger than that threshold is going to be a one, and everything lower than that threshold is going to be a zero. Okay? For when you have a multi-class classification, um, what you're going to do often is just to say, well, the class with the maximum probability is going to be my prediction. And when you have a multi-label classification, you're going to have a probability for each label and predict independently uh, on each of the labels using a threshold. So in binary classification, the way we often think about that is that we are uh, predicting the probability of one of the classes because the other probability is just one minus the probability of that class. For example, in the case of cats and dog, we may predict the probability of a, the, that an image is a cat, and then the probability that is the dog will be one minus the probability that is a, that is a, a cat, right? So we just have a single probability. In the case of multi-class classification, uh, we if we have k classes, in our case we had three classes, it was like cats, dogs, and birds, right? We will have k probabilities. But since all the probabilities is basically since we just have these k classes, we want all these probabilities to sum to one. Okay, uh, and finally we talk about uh, multi-label classification, and in this case we have um, k probabilities. But now these probabilities are in a way they they just kind of are the probability that that particular label is on the image, for example, right? So those those probabilities don't sum to one, okay? So that's basically how to think about soft predictions about probabilities. So how do you choose a threshold? If you are, for example, in binary classification, how do you choose a threshold? So one way to think about that is that you will have a validation set, right? And you will, you will, uh, make a plot uh, of threshold versus your metric of interest. For example, suppose that accuracy is what you're interested in. So you will take different thresholds and you will compute accuracy on this um, validation set. And then you will find a threshold that will kind of maximize your metric. And that will be the threshold you will use. Okay. So here is an example on, on how you would do that. You will plot all of these values and then you will pick the one that maximizes the threshold, the maximizes the metric. You will pick the threshold that maximizes the metric. So let's talk about uh, metrics and losses for classification. So, and I am assuming you guys have seen this before, so I'm gonna go a little bit fast, but then you can ask me questions later. Uh, so we, we often talk about binary classification. So you have a, a basically 
a log loss or binary cross entropy log loss and that's the the function there uh, we also talk about multi-class classification um, and and basically we are just taking the log of the probabilities and we're multiplying that by the one whole encoding of the target variable uh, and that will give you this se second formula you can prove that the second formula is very is a special case of the first formula for the case of a special case of a k equal to so that is the you know multi-class classification so I would like you guys to think about this problem and a, do this exercise in which you compute the log loss of these different examples. So please pause the video right here, go back to the formula, write it down, and then compute the log loss of these three examples. So let's talk about the log loss for uh, multi-label classification. The way you guys, the way you can think about multi-label classification is that we have k binary classification problems. So the way you do is that you think about so each of them is a binary classification, and then you have to sum all these binary classification problems and divide by the number of observations you have. Okay, so the way to think about it is that you are trying to solve all of these binary classification problems. So you're going to use k binary classification loss functions. Okay. So here is my second exercise. Notice here that uh, in this case, the true labels, you have multiple ones, right? In the true labels for In the true labels in these examples here, the true label is just kind of one of the possible classes. But in this other exercise, we can have multiple. So basically, we can have multiple things on the same image. So you can have a me, an image that have a cat and a dog. We can have an image that have a cat and a dog and a bird, right? So that's the difference between the two. So again, pause the video go back to the formula and try to compute uh, try to compute the log log loss in this in this case as well so log loss which is the loss that we talk about before is the is often used for classification problems so it's the most common uh, loss used for classification problems is uh, easy to optimize uh, so and then you guys can think about later, this is also not very difficult to prove, what is the best constant that optimizes uh, this log loss? And you can think about the vector of frequency for the J class, that would be the prediction. The, so basically you have to find, um, so for each class, if you, you, you have to give like a prediction, basically constant prediction that would be like k numbers in the case of multi-class classification right so that would be a vector of probabilities what i'm saying here is that what you do is to take the frequency of that class in your data and that would be the best the best probability vector the best constant that you can you can have Okay, so let's talk about accuracy. So accuracy is the metric that is used that is used very commonly for classification, and accuracy is just a fraction of correct uh, predictions. Uh, notice that here you assume that you already did some hard predictions, so you went from probabilities to hard predictions, and then you compute accuracy. Um, yeah, the best constant for accuracy is just to predict the most frequent class. So you predict everybody the same class, which is the most frequent class. 
is an often used uh, metric for classification, but you have to be very careful when you have class imbalance. Why is that? Suppose that 10% uh, of your data is of class one and 90% of your data is of class zero. If I just say, for example, everything is class zero, I am gonna have 90% accuracy. So in that case, um, that wouldn't be that good, right? So, so basically when you don't have a, this approximately a balance problem, you shouldn't use accuracy as your metric. Another problem with accuracy is that you don't take into account the confidence of the prediction. So this is this is basically just hard hard prediction. So if you had some probability of 0 0.6 or the probability of 0 0.9, you know, 0 0.9 is more confident than 0 0.6, but accuracy doesn't care. You both gave a hard threshold here of if you use a threshold 0 0.5, you will give a hard prediction of one to both of these observations. So accuracy wouldn't know that one of them was more confident than the other one. But on the other hand, it's much easier to understand and that's kind of why we use it. Um, so when to use accuracy? When, when your problem is approximately balanced, maybe it doesn't have to be perfectly balanced, but approximately balanced. And when every class is more or less equally important, right? So there are some cases in which the, you care more about one class than the other. And in those cases, um, maybe also accuracy is not the best thing you wanna use because you, you don't care as much about the other class, how accurate it is. So let's talk about a AUC, a area under the curve. So the first thing is, um, for example, uh, accuracy can be used for multiple classes, but AUC is just used for binary tasks, okay? So the AUC number just depends on the ordering of your predictions, not in your predictions, of, not excited on the predictions themselves. And you can, you're gonna see that in the, in the next slides. I'm gonna explain that in more detail. Uh, there are different ways of interpreting this, this metric, uh, and I'm going to talk about both of them. When you're using multi-label classification, one thing that you can do is that you can compute AUC for each one of your problems, and then maybe take the mean AUC, so that I have done that multiple times in which when you have a multi-label classification problem. And, you know, it works with unbalanced data. Um, some people don't like it when your data is too unbalanced either. So it, it's, yeah, it, it works. Uh, people use it and some people don't like it. So let me explain a AUC in the best way I, I think I can explain it. So, so there are, as I told you, there are different ways in which you can define or interpret AUC. And one of the best ways that I find, can I, I find it better is to, to is the following. AUC is the probability that the model will score a randomly chosen positive class higher than a randomly chosen negative class. And I know this is a lot, you know, I can read it again, but let me try to explain it a different way. So you have these observations. For example, I have a, an example here in which I have my predictions and my actuals, right? So you have 0 0.3, uh, but then the actual is one, that you have 0 0.5, 2, and the actual is zero, and so on, okay? So the idea is the following. You consider all pairs of observations, okay? That's basically what we are thinking about. And then you consider the pairs of observations that are correctly ordered. What does it mean? So. If I have, for example, let's consider the first two observations. Well, I have a Y of one with probability 0 0.3, and I have a target Y of zero with probability 0 0.52. That is not correctly ordered because what I want is that a label of one has a higher probability than a label of zero. Does it make sense, guys? So again, 
what I want, what I want my model to do is that the ones are going to have higher probabilities than the zeros so that I can pick a threshold that separates them perfectly. Right? So what AUC cares about is how many mistakes do you make in the ordering of pairs of observations. So let me show you an example here. So I have the same example. What I have done here is that I have ordered your predictions and I have kind of put the table like, you know, horizontally so that we can look at it more, uh, more carefully. So I am um, a, sorting the sorting of these observations by the prediction. So the first prediction is 0 0.03, and that has a target Y of 0. The second prediction is 0 0.3, and that has a target prediction of 1. The third prediction is 0 0.4, and has a target, target actual number of 0, right? So a perfect model would have all predictions of zeros before the predictions of ones. So that's actually what you want. You want that uh, observations with target zero has predictions that are lower than observations with target one. Okay. So the way to compute it, you see, is the following. Think about it the following way. Let's try to figure out how many pairs are wrong. Okay. And I am claiming here that there are three wrong pairs. And how, how do, do I go about that? So there are different ways to think about this, but one way to think about it is the following. You order your observations by the prediction, and then you try to find, you go for the target Y and try to find the first one, okay? The first one is the second observation. And then you count how many zeros do you have after that? So in this case, you have two zeros. So you have two pairs of mistake for that one, okay? Then you find the next one, okay? The next one is this observation that has prediction 0 0.45. Then that one has a zero after it. So this is another mistake, okay? Then you find the next one, and then you realize that after that one, there are no zeros. And then you find the next one, and then after that one, there is no zeros. So we found three pairs that are wrong in the order by the model. So and then what I do is I take, so how many pairs do I have? Well, uh, since I have, um, so I don't care about pairs that have the same label. I care about pairs that don't have the same label. So I, in this case, I have four ones and three zero. So I have a total of 12 pairs, okay? And then, so, you, so I take the AUC is basically the pairs that are sorted in the right way divided that the pairs that are uh, the all possible pairs, right? So, so what I do is I say, well, I am going to compute the ones that are wrong, subtract that from the total, which is 12, and divide by 12. Okay, I'm going to make you do an exercise with this, but let's think about it again, okay? So I am trying to understand, to compute the ratio of the pairs of observations that are correctly ordered divided by the pairs of observations that are incorrectly ordered. How do we compute the pairs? We compute the number of pairs of observations that have different target values. So I take the number of observations that have zeros as targets and multiply by the observations that have one of targets. So this would be 12 pairs. And then I figure out how many of those pairs are wrongly ordered by my model. And I take total number of pairs minus the ones that are wrongly ordered divided by the total. And that's how we compute a UC kind of by hand. What I want to point out is that what I like about AUC is that is to me is kind of 
easy to interpret, you know, in, in some way. So you, you print you see, you print these probabilities and you realize that what you want is the model to order well the probabilities. That's what you care about. So yeah, I find it that it's kind of is is something I can think about and understand eventually. Okay, so so I'll I'll give you an example later for you to okay, so here's the exercise. So compute AUC for this particular problem. I have ordered the predictions for you already so that it is easier for you to compute uh, AUC uh, by looking at this little table here. So please pause the video and compute AUC for this example. So what is the ROC curve? So what we do uh, to plot the ROC curve is that we take different thresholds between zero and one, and and we for for every threshold we compute true positive rate and false positive rates, and for so every point in this plot is basically a true positive rate, false positive rate versus true positive rate at a particular threshold. And so in this way, you can visualize all possible thresholds. So what is that uh, AUC? So we can prove that the area under that curve is equal to AUC and that the two definitions I have given you are equivalent. So I'm not going to prove that to you, but you can prove that that's, that's kind of the, the same. There is a little demo that if you guys want to look at, um, I don't have time today to look at it, but it's actually pretty interesting. So you can click on that uh, URL and look at a little uh, a demo of a UC that may be, may be useful for you. So finally, uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, so there are many different metrics for, for classification. And uh, so people use different metrics for different problems. Uh, I just finally wanted to mention the F score. Uh, so in particular, so there is a, a very general F beta score, but people use a lot the F1 or F2. F1 uh, is a combination of precision and recall. And when do we use that? So often people use this in binary classification problem when you care about the positive class. So what one of the classes more than the other class. Usually when you care about one of the classes more than the other class, you call that the positive class. And uh, so, and then in that case, you will be using a, a metric more than like F1. Okay, so this is the end for this part of the lecture today. Uh, see you in the next video.